Well, the chair of the transpersonal psychology section always draws the short straw and speaks on the Monday. So audiences tend to be a little bit diminished, but the quality remains amongst the audience. And it is a delight that you're able, <coughs> able to spare some <coughs> time to stay over on the Monday morning. And Malcolm's talk in particular is one that we shouldn't miss. Malcolm is a very old friend of mine. I, uh, I'm in the fortunate position of being able to introduce very old friends and very close friends. And Malcolm is certainly both a very old and a very close and a very dear friend. I've known him for, well, well over 15 years, probably 20 years. And have always been impressed by his quality as a human being, first and foremost, followed by, of course, his exhaustive knowledge of psychology and his exhaustive knowledge of spiritual traditions. He's a man, in a sense, who has devoted his life to the study of East-West psychology and the spiritual traditions that are involved. He's a man who always speaks from the heart. As you know, he's a deeply sensitive and deeply emotional man, and he feels that sensitivity extends to others in love and warmth and friendship. He always speaks in a challenging, charming and humorous way, and it is always a delight to listen to him. Malcolm, well, we are in your hands. Thank you very much. I'll be off. I'll... <laughs> <clears throat> right, thank you. Uh, I'll be off then. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, no. Right. Keep it. You hold the, the stick. I've got... Right. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, so it's my last uh, keynote as, uh, as chair... Uh, so it's, uh, already it's history in the fa fast-moving world of the regular transpersonals, as I described being on the committee to Kendall more than once. Uh, it's, you never get bored, certainly in the transpersonal section. Um, I've been checking with one or two of you over the weekend about whether to, to say anything about the context behind my uh, keynotes. And... Um, kind of links of last night because my three keynotes because you, you have you're only allowed to be chair mercifully from the BPS's point of view maybe from other people's point of view you only have a clear three years to be chair and you have to step down and during my time as chair my keynotes then to me anyway have formed a continuous theme someone might say a repetitive theme and two years ago I gave my Ret a sort of retrospective, I was 60 two years ago, and I was interested in introducing or making more op talking more openly about the divine feminine and the um, uh, exploring femaleness and maleness in modern society. Also about embodiment, having practiced and being involved in the Tibetan tradition in this time round for over 30 years. Uh, I'm very I've always been a great admirer of John Wellwood's work because he explores as a psychotherapist and as a Buddhist basically how do we put the teachings into practice. That's what I mean by embodying. Um, embodying our realization, as Wellwood speaks of in the, his lovely book um, Towards the Psychology of Awakening. Because for those of us who are getting older, old friends and old friends, as we are, you know, <laughs> things, uh, things are getting near, nearer and nearer to the knuckle, really. And um, I've always been interested, as David said, in actually integrating the wisdom of Eastern traditions um, into everyday life in the, mod in the modern world in order to make a difference to our life and well-being. And I have great respect for David's emphasis Increasingly, which is also something I wanted to support very much from the chair position, of, of gaining an increasing understanding and appreciation of Western traditions as well. Um, as many of us kind of went east, some of us are coming all the way back home, others are kind of, you know, hanging out there, but also kind of uh, keeping in touch with home or have found a new home. But there is a context for all this, and... It, it, it's to do with the life of the section, so I'm going to make, mention it, and I may well end up in tears, as is not unusual, but that's a good thing. 
Five years ago, I came to the section uh, completely broken. Uh, in fact, Trisha was so worried about me when she saw me here, she thought I was dying. Seriously thought I would, might well die. My, I have a, had a relationship with a, a twin soul, literally, and it all went wrong five years ago. And the greatest analogy for it, which is relevant to this area as well, is Wuthering Heights. I understand Wuthering Heights experientially. How if one half dies, the other one has to die. Um, it wasn't a physical death in this case. No, it was quite a close call. And five years ago, I didn't know Ingrid that well. well she's, and she's not here. I didn't know, you know, we used to meet her very occasionally, but I didn't really know her that well. And she never, ever phoned me at home. In fact, I, would, I was not sure if I would have said she knew my home phone number. But I really was <laughs> in the pits of the pits of the pits. A dreadful, dreadful time. And my life really was hanging in the balance. That was how I felt it. And Ingrid, I picked the phone up one day when I was in my slough of despond. And it was Ingrid. And immediately, which is why I probably get quite tearful, she said, what's up? Without me saying anything, what's up? And I told her, and she said, and I really didn't want to come to the conference at all. Because the other thing is that this area of North Yorkshire is a very romantic area for my relationship with my twin soul, which is still carrying on, but in a very different way. Anyway, she said, well, there's no better place, and I've said that to one or two of you over the weekend, there's no better place to be than here because you'll be surrounded by love. So I reluctantly, really reluctantly, and I was also giving a paper, ironically, on working with um, Northampton Saints Rugby with mindfulness training. And uh, I didn't want to come, I just didn't feel up to it. But, and as I came near and near to this area, which was our special area, it really was a nightmare, a real nightmare. And when I arrived here, I was so relieved that Martin, the Tracy, Martin Merlin, the Tracy, was not here. <laughs> because that meant I had Trisha to myself. Because <laughs> very often over the weekend, Martin and Trisha would disappear for days on end and explore their medieval crusades together or whatever. And I was so relieved that year, and I spoke to Martin about that several times, and that, that he wasn't here. And I just honed in on Trisha. I literally threw myself on her mercy, as it were. And she was really worried about it. Anyway, I, I, I got through the weekend, but this is where Michael comes in. Because Trisha, I didn't know Michael at all then. And Trisha said, why don't we arrange to do a healing session for Because she really thought I was about to peg out, for want of a better word. And we did a, two healing sessions, or whatever. I don't, I don't know what's going on. As I don't know, I do what was Martin was doing with my, <laughs> in relation to my sister in Australia. But obviously it had a huge impact on her, for which I'm hugely grateful for, and to everyone here for tuning in to her last night. But, um, and I had this healing session with Michael. And the link here with all this is that part one of the sessions, I think Trisha was a kind of channel, whatever, she was a channel. And I went up to Chen Rezig's Pure Land. <clears throat> and Chen Rezig said to me, the Buddha of compassion, he said, you, your relationship has been very unequal. I was always the powerful male, older male figure. I, had, I actually had a beard then, believe it or not. And this younger woman was kind of rather fawn-like. And it said, he said that your relationship will change, you will become equals, and you will discover a deeper love. Little did I know what was in store for me in the next three years. And from that time, um, I started, because I've always had an incredibly strong feminine side, and my twin soul was, literally was my other half in a very Wuthering Heights kind of way. And so I then started to realize that what started to unfold was that my survival in this world, as it felt, was actually by bringing my feminine into, not just into consciousness, but into embodiment. That's the way I've survived this dynamic. And it's actually brought us, me and my twin soul, 
to, a, very, to a, in a place where we are actually very equal and very, very balanced. And so it's been a very traumatic j- journey, uh, a hugely um, scary journey. And curiously, three years ago, I started... F- I went over to Trisha's and I went as a woman to t- say over to Trisha. And Trisha said, you must come and meet my big mates, uh, Liz and Pam, at the conference. And I brought <laughs> my, my alternative uh, clothing and things so we could have an, a girly weekend at the Transpersonal Conference. And on the first evening, you know, the Jewish joke about what makes God laugh is listening to your plans. David comes up to me and says, would you be interested in being chair of a section? And that was why, to Trisha's eternal embarrassment, we ended up clattering back from Robin Hood's Bay halfway through, with buckets and spades and things, halfway through David's keynote, which Trisha still is mortified that we did, because we were thinking it through, amongst other things. And, and so, that's three years ago, and so the last three years ago has really been about my explorations of the feminine in, in lots of different ways. And I, um, David, Martin, and myself are great lovers of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. And this is, I have this, I put this on the graves of both of my parents. And I think this still says it all. So I'm going to fit, start my talk and finish it with this, with this section from Little Gidding in Four, Four Quartets. We shall not cease from our exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. That's the key bit for me in the last five, four, three years. It costs everything. Nothing can be held back. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, and David knows this off by heart, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. I finished my talk last year about a celebration of motherhood, and little did Jess know (laughs) how pertinent pertinent that might be. It's a book by about Tibetan women called Feminine Ground. And this isn't to, you know, focus on motherhood uh, to exclude anything else because there are various many ways of being a mother but as a as a as a um, uh, a format if you like or a framework for spirituality i still think is there not anything better than birth and motherhood the practice of going beyond the individuated isolated self good motherhood says my daughter my daughter is now a mother of three children but it's about being a good mother she says you know uh, the act of giving birth and caring 24 hours every day for a totally helpless human baby is, to my mind, a most complete spiritual act and blueprint for all others. I'm also interested here in looking at samsara, samsara psychic existence, a realm of suffering. And I've really had enough of samsara. Kind of what I had a bit in common, in common with David last night. I really, don't, I really don't like realms of suffering. I've just had enough of it all. I really have. And following the Buddhist path, um, the Buddhist psychology really would say that the, core, you know, the, the basic structure of suffering is the sense of separation between ourself and reality around us and how we divide reality into, into dualistic categories. And that if we, re, if we remain in this, then we remain in it. And so the dualities of good, bad, friend, foe, positive, negative, female and male is the question I'm raising here. And you have to, have to develop a strong sense of renunciation. You want to get out of it, get out of this prison of samsara and it is an essential aspect of Buddhist psychology. That desire to be free, a desire to be free. And another word which is more, I think, cleverer word really and more palatable it's about emerging. It's not about giving up. It's not about giving up and denying or pushing away. It's not about giving up Peruna, for example. In fact, the sight of the former 
the former and present chair fighting over the sales in Peruna in, in Milton Keynes Shopping Centre in New Year, which Ingrid was here, was not particularly edifying. That, that's a joke. That's a joke. But it is true. We had, had, had so many laughs over that. <laughs> It's about emerging. You want to go beyond. And you, going beyond is going into non-duality. And it generates t- this seeking happiness and wholeness in the present. So there's a well-being side, and that's relevant to pr- applied psychology through mindfulness practice and all the clinical applications. But also it's about liberation and enlightenment. And that's what's always interested me, liberation and enlightenment. I remember reading an old copy of the Upanishads, I think. And I paraphrase it really, but right at the beginning or near the beginning of that edition is the phrase, where there is other, there is fear. Where there is other, there is fear. And that's hugely profound, sorry. That's hugely um, profound. Is it going to come back? Again, about dualistic experience and suffering. Where there is fear, there is... Where there is no other, there is fear. And of course, that's why loving kindness was given by the Buddha, not as an antidote to anger, but as an antidote to fear. His monks, as David will know the story, his monks were apparently being you know, disturbed by spirits in, in the wood or where, in the forest where they were meditating. And as an ad- antidote, the Buddha said, meditate on loving kindness. If you practice loving kindness, it, you will have no fear. And that's true my experience. Also, in the Buddhist traditions I follow, in the Tibetan tradition, I guess it applies to all traditions, but I can only speak for what I've, I know of, as it were. If you realize your own mind, you will become a Buddha. You should not seek Buddhahood anywhere else. It is solely, if you realize your mind, that's psychology, isn't it? It's total and complete psychology. If you realize your mind, you will become a Buddha. And in so doing, we transcend all dualistic perception experience. We transcend the divide, with the title of last year's talk, between self and other and all polarities, attaining liberation, freedom, and enlightenment. Also, if you practice altruism and compassion, it's also purifying the mind, bringing us closer to our Buddha nature, which lies within all of us. So, one of the tr- what I want to explore here is transcending the duality of male and female. To my mind, many of the, my Buddhist teachers, and it's still true to me, they seem to have transcended gender. You can't say that, you know, you can obviously, physically you can describe a form, but in every other way, and sometimes even in that, in, 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 physically in some ways, but mainly not that, obviously, uh, they seem to have tr- transcended conventional aspects of gender. And the Tibetan Tantric tradition involves working with our human embodiment. This is, I want to emphasize this, the importance of embodiment, being how we are in the world, not just as an idealized principle, is to transcend dualistic experience through the union of female and male energies. And the Tantric tradition also is about developing and transforming all sorts of aspects of the human personality, the human psyche, I should say, so what I then coming on to then is that now having grandchildren and being surprised how I can love my grandchildren as much as my own children. I wasn't really banking on that, but that, that's kind of happening. And seeing the little souls arrive, and of course from you know speaking to friends and you know people from singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. I'm sure we all have a view of of an enlightened being, enlightened mind, as something which is way beyond categories like gender and which is panoramic, vast, boundless, and includes all, the whole dimension of human being and, and beyond. So I've seen these little souls arrive in the last five years. My um, granddaughter, the oldest one, is six now. I then wonder then what's being done to little souls when, say, when they arrive. And of course the, thing that, the first thing that happens is that they're put into a category of one or the other. Male or female. And the more I reflect on this and the more I've freed myself on this, I do think it's one of the worst things we do. From a 
transpersonal point of view. And so I'm talking about here, is there a loss of wholeness? Historically and currently, boys and girls' socialization trains at best not to fully develop their so-called contrasexual aspect, anima or animus, of course, in the Jungian sense. And, of course, Jung was very articulate on this. But at worst, develop an aversion, fear, denial, or even something of a demonization of the contrasexual. And I have tracked, you know, the changes in female embodiment in my lifetime from when I was little to where, uh, when I, where I am now. But I see it particularly with little boys, how I was in a toy shop, I met up with Ingrid um, several weeks ago in Olney, we were talking through a conference, which is basically an excuse to have a, have a nice lunch, really. And um, I went into a lovely little toy shop, traditional toy shop in Olney, to get some... Um, things for my granddaughter's birthday where she's, I got her a really nice doll's house, just for her, <laughs> primarily and um, and there was two little boys in there, one was a tiny little boy holding a very girly doll and he had an older sister and they were looking at girly dolls for him with his mother and, she, and everyone was very charmed by this and, so, and, she, and she said well he likes to be like his sister you, you like to be like your big sister don't you and he said, you know, sweetly, yes, you know, sort of tottering around. And there's a slightly older boy, and as his, his mother was talking to the shop assistant, um, he was just looking at things, and he picked up a girl's, um, a girl's makeup compact, and she said, you're a boy, put it down. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again. So there's a little, and I see it with my little grandson, who's brought up in a female world, and he just... I'm, I'm sure he must just see himself as a girl because everyone else is female. And he would say to my son, big beefy rugby player, he'd say, good girl. And why wouldn't you? Because that's what you hear all around you. And my little granddaughter's got the hair slides and all that stuff, and so he wants to put on a hair slide. And very gently, my daughter will steer him away. And I've got a woman colleague with a very androgynous life force of a little son who basically is Doctor Who, but also is a princess and the queen. And he... And what he went, one day he went to school, she allowed him to dress as a, a favourite female cartoon character. And she said he, and he's a very attractive little boy, physically attractive. And uh, she said he was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And she took him to the school and he had that day. But she was aware of other mothers looking at her and that monitoring and as a little, little tiny soul, my argument here is you learn very early, especially from the male side, but of course it applies to the female side as well, to push away. And what are you pushing away? My argument here is that you're pushing away a whole panorama of being and you're creating an extra layer. It's difficult enough to access your better nature, your deep nature. But if you've got these layers and layers and layers of conditioning and negative conditioning, in some cases fear... I've spent so much time kicking a ball around with, little, with boys and uh, teenagers. You see this ac in, in action, that they push away, they learn to push away, won't go near, that's girls' stuff, I'm not going anywhere near that. And my argument is that as girls' stuff has actually become increasingly mainstream through the changes in female embodiment, if you're a little boy growing up now, then what do you do to be different? How do you distinguish yourself? So I'm suggesting this can cause deep, deep problems within the psyche. Also, historically, conditioning of males has been very, very pernicious, such as petticoat punishment, the way in which you'd try and bring a little, a, a, um, a little boy to order. If you look back you know, uh, in Victorian times or whatever, then you humiliate him by dressing him as a girl or making him wear something feminine. And I've got my feminist colleague Lisa, when we both gave our presentation, both wearing skirts a couple of years ago, on transgender and spirituality. When we're looking at the Zimbardo study, which we do with first years, you see again that the power dynamics are in many ways to feminize the, the lads who are in the Zimbardo experience. They wear little dresses, which are, you know, they're called tunics, or whatever, but basically it's like little dresses and so on, little hats. And that comes out in a recent study about boys who are successful in school, they're seen as feminine and gay. gay. Now, there's also a pernicious aspect on the girls' side. 
And I was talking to, because I'm work, work mainly with young women, mainly female students, and they would, what happens with the equivalent for girls would not be to masculinize them, which would be interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine punishing a little girl by making him wear, her wear um, a, a, a David Beckham shirt, which lots of little girls wear? And not many little, little boys freely go to skirt, school in a party dress. And nobody blinks. They would all think it was, well, mainly would think it was very, very strange. So there's something very, very deep going on here. And what you learn as a male then is that you've got to keep away. The worst thing that can happen to you is to be turned into a girl. And, but in a Zimbardo study, when I was talking to young women, and this came out in, in um, a study referred to on Thinking Aloud program on Radio 4. The boys are seen as feminine. So again, the way in which you attack a boy, the way in which you control him or humiliate him or whatever, is to fe f either feminize him or, or describe him in a feminine way. What happens with the girls though, is that they become asexual. It would be like shaving all their hair off, for example. So rather than putting a male in a dress and teasing them and taunting them, say, the female equivalent, and that came out in the study of school children as well, would be to kind of take away their sexuality. And so it's, a kind of, you know, so it's an interesting kind of way of attacking what is very central in both cases. But it's, slightly, it's similar but slightly different. And so my argument here is that is our gender identity a prison for our full being? And the argument... The importance of this for me is that if you go on to, if you are um, doing a retreat, what you discover then are deeper and deeper and deeper levels, in my experience anyway, of social conditioning, of cultural conditioning. And it's, very diff it's a big job to get into that and start to uproot it and start to let it go in order to connect, as I would see, with your deeper, boundless Buddha nature. And the depth of our conditioning is phenomenal. It is amazing what structures we have assimilated at such a deep level. And my argument here is that the gender divide is a very, very deep structure, which we need, I feel, it would be much far helpful if we were able to let that go. So do we need to transcend our cultural <laughs> conditioning? I've always wanted to get... I was exposed to a lot of Popeye cartoons and um, I've always been um, taken by him about that slogan. In his, after he's had his spinach, spinach and he's triumphed over Bluto, um, I am what I am and that's all that I am. And I do wonder if there's something quite profound there. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. The conditioned self then here and especially from a male point of view, but also from a female one, it's not what I am, but it's what I am not. What I am not, I am not. If I'm a little boy, I'm not a little girl. And the way in which you maintain that conditioned identity is pushing away so much that is feminine. So it becomes first nature, almost. And it's pushed away out of conscious awareness. And Great Tibetan teachers like Trumper, Wellwood, who's a student of Trumper, would say that we have to make friends of ourselves and also with the panorama, the panorama of our, of our being. So as I've mentioned in previous years, two years, from my time when girls only ever wore dresses and boys only ever wore shorts, let alone long trousers, looking at probably how most women are attired here today, would not be wearing trousers or jeans or whatever uh, 50 years ago. And like Tricia, for example, who's a similar age to me, she remembers being sent home from work for wearing trousers. And there's a huge, there was a huge outcry when women started to wear trouser suits. I mean, a real outcry, because it was not good, not seen as good. My argument is that the changes as a parent and as a grandparent, and because I've spent such a lot of time with young people, the male position has not changed very much. In some ways, it's almost, in a subtle way, it affirms a male position because it's like if you're a football-mad bloke and you have a girlfriend then who is a football-mad woman, she will dress as you dress. But she's also female, so that also makes you know, it's a real bonus. 
So, but in some ways, it doesn't really. It's not a challenge to the from the male side. It's a challenge. It's the woman. It's the woman who's entering into the male role, male embodiment. This is an important thing here for me. Is embodiment in the world? How we live our world? How we live our lives? And how we sense and be moment to moment? And the consequences are important. And the, look at the fear. The fear that you know effeminate men or homosexual men generate. The terror. And I do think there's a great terror in a lot of male conditioning. It's a fear. Rupert and me have spoken about this a lot of time, about the depth of the fear of being seen as feminine or female or effeminate or whatever. And also, which makes sense to me, especially with my Wuthering Heights experience, is that our romantic liaisons are seeking wholeness, through relationship with someone else who well would describe process well would describe so well in books like journey of the heart and so on love and intimacy from this perspective is about could be about seeking lost aspects of ourselves and the sense of being at home with someone you're deeply in love with feeling right feeling i'm really able to be me feeling whole feeling complete and so on and Wellwood's very good on writing about romantic love as a spiritual journey. So what is our heart's desire then? What do we deeply, deeply want about ourselves? And now the symmetry then in challenges to femaleness and maleness, the term cross-dressing then now applies far more to male behaviour. You wouldn't say to a woman who's wearing jeans and a, and a David Beckham shirt that she's cross-dressing. It applies male to female. And it usually has a, neg- a value judgment attached to it. So female identity and behaviour, I argue, has gone far more into the masculine, as I've said before, I think, and the other way, far less so. And modern women may be bemused at the struggles women had in the 60s and so forth in wearing trousers or whatever, and there's a recent case in Sudan, wasn't there, the woman being imprisoned for refusing not to wear trousers. Now... I'm obviously emphasising a male side here, but there's also another side, and I've talked about this with Lisa... And she would present this to students. She would say that the feminine qualities, I love feminine qualities, and especially from a spiritual point of view, the traditional qualities of gentleness, compassion, healing, grace, motherhood, intuition, sensibility. She would say from a feminist position, these are not valued in present day society. Therefore, and I'm wondering where, you know, on the one hand we're talking about the female experience in a very positive way, you know, kind of seats gained, you know, in a new labour sense, you know, seats gained from the, from the, nas- you know, the, the, the noble left from the nasty right or something like that. And, um, but also, the argument may also go here is that have women as well as men now overvalued the masculine at the ex- expense of the feminine? And the more open I am about this, I, I get people who come up to me and say, by the way, you know, you, I, I, I understand what you... I think it's really important. The reason I didn't come to the sessions yesterday, mon- yesterday morning, I met up with one uh, late woman who was having to leave, and she said, I think it's really important what you're talking about. It's affected my whole life, this. This imbalance. How do you get a balance, whether you're a woman or a, a male or female, between the masculine and the feminine? Have we now then overemphasized the masculine? And I heard Erin Pitsy, who, who founded Women's Refuges, saying that men are now lost. And she, I hadn't realized how much pressure she came from extreme feminists for saying that men suffer from domestic violence as women do. And she says that women have lost their way. And I hadn't realized that she was driven out of the UK to live in America because of the intimidation which she received from, from women for, for, for really saying, well, there's two sides to this. There's two sides to domestic violence. So that, that was just this week. So mixed messages for women and girls, listening to Woman's Hour, which I've said about two years ago, is my kind of nemesis, because I'm exactly the same age as Woman's Hour. Um, increased pressures on young girls, and of course, being the father, being the parent of two girls, but also now you see little, little girls, you know, little primary school girls and my granddaughter, and people talk about the sexualization of young girls, but also being expected to compete in many ways with boys and men, and now, you know, talking to youngsters, students, the pressures on girls now are actually so great, which they weren't on women thinking of my spouse, 
um, who went to university. In a sense, if, you, if a woman picked up a career in the 1970s, it would be, then good luck to her, perhaps, you know. But she's not expected to, and she's not expected to be head of ICI. And so the expectations are perfect looks, relationships, careers, family, material success, and Sham is nodding, because we've, we've talked about... It just, it just arises. It just arises in conversation. However, historical views of transgender... Being, be, not being confined to one's biology and not so abnormal, not so weird. And I've always been engaged by the fact that there was a, a version of Venus, Castina, in Roman times, who was assigned to be sympathetic and understanding to the yearnings of feminine souls locked up in male bodies. So it's not new. And the ma- males, um, presumably the females as well, <laughs> dressed as women, or may have done, or did do. Also, transgenderism in mythology. Um, there's some nice stories from a female point of view. Um, I've, um, I've, I've heard more than one version of this story. I've heard a Hindu version as well. Um, assuming that's not a Hindu version. When uh, a man or a group of men have uh, dis- displeased the gods, they punish them by turning them into women. And then they found this is really good being a woman, and especially with respect to sex. This is far more fun. And this annoyed the gods again, so they changed them back again. <laughs> um, and I have come across a Hindu example. Also, the, an East Indian story of a king who's magically changed into a woman. And he said, and again, so whether this is male envy, of course, you don't know the origins, but there are, um, um, it's an interesting view. Anyway, also, as I mentioned in a paper a couple of years ago, but there are examples where cross-gender, transgender are often or can be associated with spiritual qualities. Native American cultures, the Hijra sect in India, though they seem to have lost some of their spiritual power in modern life. And whether that's due to westernization, I don't know. Anyway. But also I was reading about Ramakrishna. I guess it's the same Ramakrishna you're talking about. But in what I was reading, he was saying that Everyone in the world is female in relation to the divine. If one is to know the man, one must take the state of the woman as a female friend, handmaiden, or as a mother. Um, From the sources I read, anyway, apparently he spent time living as a woman, living as a handmaiden. And so actually, so therefore the embodiment, the embodiment of being female as a, as a path, or part of the path, or maybe a big part of the path, towards the divine feminine, or the divine, was very fundamental. And the pers- this is in a book by Panda, oh, sorry, sorry a book by Sarah Dananda, who wrote his uh, bio- biography, it said that it, it was a conscious sadhana enabling him to discover the non-duality, this is the whole point here for me, discovering the non-duality beyond conditioned gender. And there's the um, Hindu god uh, who is half man and half woman. And also there is a view, there's a paper in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, that maybe it's time to think of a Western third gender, which incorporates both. Nanda, in her book, Neither Man Nor Woman, The Hijras of India, suggests it seems... She thinks, from an Indian perspective, it seems, it seems to her rather curious to the Western mind of modern times to seriously accept that many individuals may have mixed or alternative gender identities. And of course, there's the um, more recent European attitudes of a dread of effeminacy, uh, gender nonconformity, and a lot of violent persecution of males um, who don't fit in and, of course, the criminalization of male uh, homosexuality. And then the famous court's case is people's disruptions to careers. And when I um, grew up in the Manchester in the 50s and 60s, there was no mention of homosexuality. It didn't exist. I would say it didn't exist. It wasn't there. It wasn't there at all in terms of how you, cat- you categorize each other. And I do wonder, that in some ways, there was a paradoxical liberalism there in that I hear young men saying, you know, very talented young men saying that, well, if you show any femininity nowadays, then women and men assume you're gay. 
and he saw it then. So it seems to me that gayness maybe is a very, you know, which is obviously fine in, in and of itself as a state of being, but maybe it's a very ready category to put people into. And as I said, the recent study on boys' success in schools, boys who are successful, they're both effeminate and therefore also gay. And my twin son I was referring to earlier, her son, teenage son, 13, 14, again, he has gayness. Am I gay? Am I gay? On, on his mind. To an extent to which we never did. There were guys who were effeminate or sissies or whatever you call But they were actually, looking back, they were pretty well tolerated. It was just how they were. And certainly if you look back at old pictures of us, some pictures of Meta had a 40-year reunion, and uh, pictures of us in Rimini, when they hitchhiked to Rimini, uh, uh, to celebrate the England winning the World Cup. Probably not the most uh, pr- prudent of places to go, Italy. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and the pictures of us in the sea. And we look very much like our six, my six-year-old granddaughter. Skinny little bodies, because none of us had a muscle between us in the 1960s. Skinny little bodies and longish hair. So from a, dis- you know, from a distance, you look like you know, a little straight body of a little a child. So, yeah, none of us had a muscle between us at all. Where's my son, you know, pumping iron and all the rest of it. Also, the curious cases and sad cases of Oscar Wilde are well known, but also the timing of the Alan Turing, who received this <gasps> government apology. And he was a war hero. <laughs> you know, he cr- helped to crack the Enigma code. He was a real war hero. And what happened to him? He was convicted of gross indecency for having a relationship with another man. And then he was given female hormones and grew breasts, and he committed suicide. Genius, a great, great, great genius. And look what we did to him, we in inverted commas. And it's not that long ago. Um, for what? So I think it's important we realise, in a sense, or we, we look at what's going on here. Rabsi Nesbitt, I like Rabsi Nesbitt. I was talking to someone about him. I saw an old, it, 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 uh, I saw an old uh, um, program, you know, repeat, repeat the other day. And his mate, you see, wants to say thank you, but in govern you can't say thank you. So he has to get him, ask him into his house, you see. Gives him a bottle of wine and a bit of brown newspaper. And he hands it to him like that. We were talking about it, weren't we? And he, and he says, thank you, Rab. I'm not a puff. <laughs> I'm not a puff, mind. And then Rab says, I'm not a puff either. You know, when he turns to the camera for this bit of social comment, then he says, mind you, it might be better if we were. We wouldn't have to say thank you, looking as if we were sucking a bag of lemons. <laughs> so, also, a, a pattern I find is that if you are, you know, you say you like to wear pretty things or want, uh, like to express your femininity from a mass, male, biological male point of view, people assume, oh, perhaps you're gay, perhaps you're really a woman, really a girl. What they don't think, or what doesn't seem to happen so readily, but you can be both that. And I spent a lot of time over the years supervising sports dissertations, mainly with young women, obviously not entirely. And they tell me, well, you know, they, they put on their football kit or rugby kit or whatever it is, and if you see them play and I watch them play, and I've played with women footballers, not only are they very good, surprise, surprise, or can be very good, but also they just, uh, one Greek, Greek student I had, and she said, well, I have to be a good girl. You know, I have to be a good girl. My mum and my auntie expect me to put on a wear a nice dress and help in the house, in the kitchen. Then she goes off and has trials for Arsenal ladies. But she said, well, you just flick. You flick from being a laddish lass, if you like, if we use those terms, to being a good girl, a feminine daughter, and she said, I just, you just flick from one to the other, because it's about being, and she has that access to her being. So she's both feminine and masculine in terms of stereotypes. She's not either or. Quintin Crisp, who's a great, there's great courage, of course, in, in challenging social boundaries here. Quintin Crisp said that God made me both male and female. And so many women have told me now that I was a real tomboy, you know, and then I decided to be ladylike, or decided to be feminine. So again, this is about embodiment. So, young, so many young women now embody themselves in both the feminine and the masculine. And I say, how many guys do you know who say that I was a real little girl, you know? Yeah, everyone thought I was a girl, always fantastic dresses all the time. But then I decided to be a, be a lad, you know? 
when I started to fancy, fancy women. I don't come across many examples of that. Jeeves and Wooster. <laughs> Bertie Wooster to Jeeves on the fascist Roderick Spode, who uh, that David will remember. Um, one cannot Jeeves, in his, his, his wise reflections after Jeeves has solved another conundrum, one cannot Jeeves be both a successful dictator and a designer of women's underclothing. Indeed not, sir. Tara, of course, that was determined, um, determined to attain enlightenment in female, female form. I refer to discussions by Ken Wilbur and, uh, and Cohen in the magazine What is Enlightenment or Enlightenment Beyond, whatever it's called now. What is Enlightenment, it was called last year and it's changed its title. Enlightenment Lex, that's it, thank you. About femaleness and maleness in the modern world. I have to start whizzing through now. Um, they argue that if you are a youngish woman, I guess under the age of 30, it's hard to appreciate how different things were for your mother and certainly for your grandmother. And so many times in our shop, where George Best and Dennis Law used to come in, Matt Busby in, our, in, in Chalton Cromarty in Manchester, women would say, it's a man's world, isn't it? Next time, I'm coming back as a man. And I've not heard that. I know I said it last year, and the American lass, Rosemary Anderson, who was here, said she hadn't heard it for a while in America, and I haven't heard that for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> Do you hear it nowadays? Something's changed then. You heard it all the time as a youngster. It's a man's world, isn't it, love? Yeah, you know, so... <laughs> Bloody hell, you know. There's this fantastic camaraderie amongst women, of course, which, uh, which um, Justin Hoffman discovered when he was playing Tootsie. He went out as a woman, you know, to experience being out and about. And he felt he was part of kind of a secret society who all knew they were kind of up against it and were kind of, you know... <laughs> but anyway... True, true or not. And Tara, of course, was told that she would have to become a man to um, become enlightened. Of course, she didn't. And so, obviously, as a great female, female hero, uh, what happens? Uh, just uh, look of the look, wonderful Tara. Right, the female journey. Now, what's useful to remember was a colleague of mine, a friend of mine from Northampton University. She was on the Melvin Bragg program on Radio 4. You see, I have a radio on a lot. Talking about, to, talking about the anti-suffragette movement. And it's important to remember this sort of thing, that whenever women have made their various advances, you know, you know there's so much courage, incredible courage. You know, women who went into the police in the 1960s and 70s and what women had to deal with, just phenomenal stories of heroism. And, and you read... Victorian accounts, you know, of life at that, that time and women saying it's unnatural, it's unnatural to go out of the home, it's unnatural, we're, we're mothers, we're wives, this is what, we're, what God meant us to be. And so all the time it was seen as a struggle by many people, or some people, against the natural order of things. It's not a very good photo, but I'm not very good at computers and downloading things. But Serena, look at Serena Williams now, into glamour with huge muscles. Great muscles, big muscles, and she wears glamorous clothing. That wouldn't have happened not so long ago. And then I've got, I'll go through these very quickly. I'll start speeding up. I, look, I picked out some old photographs of tennis, women's tennis champions. And just look how embodiment has changed. Because what you wear affects how you are in the world, as every woman knows. And every man knows, really. But... Um, Mural Rob, 1902. There you are, that's what she was wearing. <laughs> and you notice how straight the hat is and the, and the, and the tight waist, of course. Um, Lottie Dodd, 1904. Look at that interesting... I kind of like the dress. But notice the little hat, the little cricketer's hat. So again, you've got, she's a woman, but also she's not, you know. Yes. Um, the dreaded short dress of 1905. <laughs> um, I know. Actually, yes. Um, Dorothea Lambert Ch Chambers. You say, looking a bit more. Um, and then, of course, you know, Martina, who is also a gay lady, isn't she? How she, in many ways, 
present, embodied the, mask, the male. There's also Margaret Court, who David will remember, who was a you know, big, big Aussie lass, wasn't she? And she was a powerful figure. But in, you know, people think more of... And that was, she was in the 1960s, late 60s, like the elegant Maria Bueno, who I'm sure David, David and I both found very, very appealing, the Brazilian. Yes. So, so she embodies very much and plays the game as men played it. And, of course, her immense physicality and, of course, wearing essentially male uh, clothing. Anyway, f- uh, this is like one of Ingrid's... Uh, <laughs> Biodancer things. But anyway, femininity in sport, all those images of being elegant, graceful, non muscular. Obviously, these are, these are older, older. Well, it's coming, that's sorry, it's colour. Also, 1935, this is a German example, Jess. Whilst you, uh, how to exercise whilst making a bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite good, really. How to exercise. Um, and contemporary female athletic power, you know, the muscularity of women. Uh, and the power which women have. If you've ever been to an athletics... I really like athletics. I've always been involved in running. You see how fast the women run. It's just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And it, there's been the um, European Championships, hasn't there? Football Championships. And England got into the final. And we won't be, say who they were beaten by, Jess. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, as Rupert said, beaten by bloody Germany on the front row here. (laughs) So that's a woman on the left. And again, that physicality, power, and so on. And and that's a male goalkeeper. Um, Yes. This is my style, though. They solace their wretchedness by duets after supper. So that's kind of what I would prefer. So that's a, a, an alternative approach. The male experience then, and this is Wilbur and Kern. I'll go through this quite, obviously quite quickly now. Um, they were arguing really that many males seem to flip between arrogance and weakness. This is their views. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I'm just presenting their, their views. And of course we know true, true humility arises from deep strength. So really it was a kind of critique of maleness or a qu- questioning of maleness. There's a Guardian picture, again, when, yet again, there's so much has come up which is anti-male. I feel so sorry for my son's generation, because compared to my generation, whilst I, you know, bemoan not being able to wear dresses and things as much as I would have wanted to and all that kind of thing, of course, the female view was hugely circumscribed in terms of what you were expected to be, be. And the male view, really, was that you could do anything. And in fact, you were expected to do anything. In some ways, by being equipped in a kind of uniform of a suit or, you know, blazer and tie, it was a kind of uniform which then equipped you to go venture out into the world to do whatever you wanted to. You're also expected to do something. You're expected to earn a living and provide for a family. There are those expectations which now are also on women, young women perhaps. But for my son's generation, he's 27, 28, ever since he landed... This, I'm not sure I've ever heard anything positive said about young men. I'm really, I'm really struggling to look for it. So what, what, and then you're in school, and it's always the girls who are top of the class. What's that telling you? For David and my time, the thing to be was top of the class. I'm sure it applied to David as well. It was never the worst thing to be. The worst thing was to be bottom of the class. You know? So things have changed hugely. And so you get, and with the changes in fertility treatments and so on, there's real, real messages then of, well, it's considered maybe we'll have a, a maleless world in the future, but I know very successful men you know, who are millionaires, successful businessmen, saying, well, we're rubbish, aren't we? We're not needed anymore. These are middle-aged men, 50. It's a serious business. So what about the younger generation, younger men who, who are brought up? As a governor of a secondary school and a primary school, to be fair to the mainly women teachers, of course, the disappearance of male teachers... And the, and the reluctance of males to have anything involved in children at all nowadays. I know young men who say, I'd love to be a head teacher, but I'm not going to risk it. And that's terrible. And that's a terrible consequence, really, of, of anti male doctrines which have been peddled. And so there's big, big consequences here. And I come across more and more young women who, because everyone, everyone's younger than me, um, in their 30s who have escaped feckless men, 
talented, attractive, capable, professional women. And so many I'm coming across now have escaped from such men to bring up their children on their own. I do wonder if there's been a whole generation of young men who've just not grown up or just not learned what it is to be a father and an adult. That's just my thoughts. But negative views then, you know, well, you can perhaps manufacture sperm now, so you don't need men at all. Would it be so bad? And so you have these kind of scary images of, uh, <laughs> of um, you know, dominatrix kind of figures. Wilbur says masculine strength, and I think that is also a factor in schools, and maybe strength and physical power can be misunderstood as hostility. And he, w- he said that the qualities of masculinity are not transcended, they're simply oppressed, and it's a disaster. This is the average postmodern male. And it cre- creates weak, inauthentic men. Very difficult for men to envision an image of an evolved man. These are just their views in our discussion. Um, there seems to be a general reticence to embrace a certain kind of fearlessness, what it means to be male. We're denying ourselves, and as men, I guess, a form of authenticity. Also, of course, as we know, as, you know, as everyone here knows, really, as you, as you, as you go, follow a spiritual path, of course, you tend to transcend stereotypes, gender stereotypes, and integrate the fem- feminine and the masculine. And also, of course, as you know, and David's excellent example from the army, we also know that men are totally capable of expressing what would be seen as fem... fem- and that's the argument, in a way, is that men, you know, because we're, we're, we're boundless beings. We're boundless, boundless beings. Um, as a, an Irish woman I was talking to about possibility of retirement, and she had dr- grown up and had sons, and her, fa- her husband had been in a totally masculine environment. And she, they've had a, a granddaughter, and she says the change in him being able to relate to a female, a young female, is amazing. She's just astonished, a 60-year-old man, how being able to relate to the feminine, because he was in a business world which was very aggressive, so his whole life was spent in this very aggressive, if you like, assertive, masculine ex-world, and now, as he's getting on a bit, he's presented with this little, little girl, and he, she says the changes in him, what it's enabled him to access and to express are phenomenal. She would never have believed it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in his stages. Well, um, just a couple of minutes, yeah. Uh, yeah so can I press on for a few more minutes? Yes. Yes, I know, yeah. Um, so they were saying that maybe because there have been these great challenges to traditional gender roles, uh, maybe there's a, a whole new envisaging of what it is to be male and fe- or female. And that Gender becomes a problem when we over identify with. Um, so, there's a definition of enlightenment. So, what would be an unself conscious expression of gender? And what could be more arbitrary than gender? So, Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. There's a couple of stories here. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, one is of a guy who had a mother who was very anti-male, I guess. And she says, unconsciously all men want to marry their mothers, but not me. I was too much like my mother. (laughs) I could cry at how much abuse I could have avoided when I stuck up for myself. I'm a boy, the song by The Who, you know, about a boy, a woman who wants his little boy to be a little girl, like like the other little girls. As uh, as, um, Yes, you got for, for... a Danish guy, yeah, from Denmark. There's one, because uh, you, you live in Denmark, don't you? Yeah. There's one, one argument here is that she, I'll go through this very quickly. She, she went to, to do a, 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 um, a magazine article in Scandinavia, and she thought actually that trying to create a gender neutral society was, was disadvantageous to men. And um, Oliver James, I quite like in a way, patriarchy in drag, she says. Oliver James, Denmark is the only country where men are more depressed than women. So I don't know if that's true. And I'm going to have to go through these quite quite quickly. Uh, Skip through these. Whatever happened to the Vikings, Nina? So she says that men are having more difficulties trying to combine work and family than women do. 
and that men can never actually be biological mothers. A reflection on contemporary ma masculinity. Um, yeah, so it's kind of saying what male freedom to be. Yeah, so there are changes, aren't there? Men push prams now, long or dyed hair and so forth, which would be unheard of 40 years ago. Individuals, Eddie Izzard, who people, a lot of people like, equal clothing rights and so on. So there are these challenges. And um, as I mentioned, my own experiences in the prayer before birth, Lou McNeese again, who I read out last night, prayer before birth, I'm not yet born, console me. I feel that the human race with tall walls wall me, with strong drugs dope me, with wise lies lure me. And the older I get, I realize how much of our experiences are constructed through social conditioning and how crucial it is, for me anyway, to let that go. Just let me be, as we sang last night with uh, Andrew. My being was always much more than, um, than what society said I was. And I never fitted into, um, never fitted into a gender, a category. Never, ever did that. And, you, and from a male point of view, you really have nowhere to go. Grace and Perry, portraits of an artist as a young girl. He has his mute, you know, he calls himself Claire, doesn't he? he wears these 1950s dresses, actually, which I sort of <laughs> would have loved to have worn. His, um, you read his, his childhood, a working class childhood, and he was knocked around a lot, as I was, and a lot of people were from my generation. Just, you know, knocked around a lot. As, as normal, normal life. And especially for any signs of effeminacy or being a girl. Don't be a girl. Stop being a girl. Kind of thing. And it was, you know, it's horrible. It's just night. And I, the thought of doing that to a six, my six year old granddaughter, you know, who's down there, or even more, three year old or whatever, it's just unthinkable. But it was normal life for so many people. And in his autobiography, he talks about really the harshness and the bitterness of that world and how a feminine world and wearing pretty things and so on was a, was a real taste of sweetness, that there was some sweetness in the world, there was something nice in the world. And that's how he started to express himself in, uh, in a female way. There's the, um, with, with the male and female Hindu god Ard Rishvara. Becoming whole. So, now we're coming on to going beyond, you know, get, to finish off really, going beyond uh, dualities. Even from Darwin, he says, My mind seems to become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of fact. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. So that's a division between Eric Fromm, between heart and head. Process Darwin describes here as continued since his time at a rapid pace. Separation of reason and heart is almost complete. Eric Fromm is a great favorite of people, David and my generation in particular, I imagine. The supremacy of a cerebral at uh, the expense of the... Of the um, emotional. And he argues that a new society would need to integrate the spiritual core of a late medieval world, which I'm sure David would approve of, with the development of rational thought and science. He wrote that 1970s, you know, a long time ago he wrote that. So coming, the synthesis, he calls it the city of being, would be, would be a lovely synthesis. So we're getting now gender in the future, man and superwoman, never underestimate men to <laughs> pull something out of the hat especially if it involves power, maybe. So you never know what might, what might happen in the future. Um, so I'm saying it to round off here, is that we do face great challenges. Trumper, in his kind of mercurial way, said that women are crazy, men are stupid. And uh, there's a lovely couple of books, which I mentioned to one or two people, by Judith Summer Brown, The Dakini's Warm Breath. The feminine principle, this is the last bit really. Of course, there's no real difference on an ultimate level between uh, women and men. But nature's redemptive, inherent existence, vast and expansive, free of conceptual elaboration. And there are sacred masculine and feminine en en energies as part of the body mind, and that's Dakini's warm breath. 
Guru Rinpoche, who brought Tantric Buddhism into Tibet, Yogini seasoned in secret mantra, grounded liberation, is this human frame, this, human common, this common human frame, and here distinctions, male and female, have no consequence. Yet if Bodhicitta graces it, a woman's form indeed is supreme. That was his consort saying, you know, this, the pressure to be male and the devaluation of the female. Lama Yeshi, one of my main teachers, asked by a Western nun who's a gay woman, but again, the traditional preference for male rebirth. Lama Yeshe, who was an um, a abbotess in a previous life, said, there are distinct f- spiritual advantages in being a woman. Women tend to experience more with their heart, men with their uh, intellect. And I'd like to mention Anne Klein. Um, she's integrated both feminist thought in the book Meeting the Great Bliss Queen by saying that if you follow a spiritual practice, you do develop, you do discover there is a core, isn't there? There's a spiritual transpersonal core. And you can also accept that there is a constricted part of being a human being. And of course, from a traditional feminist point of view, they don't accept, accept any form of essentialism. And her book, you know, there's nothing essential because it means that you're kind of basically female or male. They don't accept that. But she argues that there's actually a non dual essential aspect to, to human nature. And, and on top of that, if you like, there is also the construction of gender and identity. And that the Great Bliss Queen has many, uh, many forms. But coherence lies not in a unifying narrative, but in the dynamic of clarified, clarified attention. And we really are at the end now. Um, I'm saying we really need a, fi- need a fearlessness, really. And especially from a male point of view, going into the feminine, um, it is a courageous journey. But the benefits, well, from my personal experience, are, are, are immense. Prajnaparamita, the Buddha of, uh, wisdom, the wisdom of the Heart Sutra, wisdom gone beyond, wisdom gone beyond all conceptualization. Love again. I love, therefore I am. A, a, um, a, a poem on poetry, please. These issues are not going to, wear, going to go away. The old beliefs are wearing thin. There is a groping for the new. We know only a little bit about the direction the changes are taking place, but nothing about where the changes will end up. We have to have in mind not an orthodoxy, but a wide and compassionate recognition of the storm of ideas in which we are all living in which we must make our spiritual nests, find spiritual rest as best we can. Gregory and Mary Bateson, Angel's Fear in Anne Klein's book. And so again, we come back to the beginning, (laughs) to finish with the little gidding. If you realize your own mind, you'll become a Buddha. You should not seek Buddhahood elsewhere. Geshe Kalsen's book, Understanding the Mind. And I think we're going to finish off with little gidding again. We shall not cease from our exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongs of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Thank you. That was an absolutely brilliant exposition. The extraordinary breadth of your scholarship in the field and the sensitivity of your understanding Mm. are very, very rare gifts. Thank you for giving them to us. Thank you for sharing them with us. We haven't unfortunately got time. I'll perhaps allow one very short question, if I may. Um, Yes, okay, I'll come. But if I I could just um, have the prerogative that is quite wrongly and unfairly <laughs> given to the chair at the end of these sessions to say something. Uh, I was just thinking that there are so many disadvantages, perhaps, that you didn't have time to touch on in the case of a male. I remember even when I was a boy in junior school, we always thought, because we little boys used to get together and chat about these things, that the girls had all sorts of privileges that we didn't have. Yes. If we'd all done something wrong, the boys were beaten, the girls yes. were let off. Yes. The girls were always let out first yeah. at playtime. My daughter themselves. says that, even and in this day and age, that 
that she knew yeah. that the boys got away, the girls got away with a lot more. The girls get away with a lot more. That was more. her experience. Yeah. <laughs> of course, in Victorian times, actually allowed uh, little boys to dress. In fact, they made them dress as girls, which was not yeah. easy for them. But I also found, as you go through, I, a national service went on into the 1960s. I caught the end of it, could have got out of it, could have gone to university first, decided I wanted to do it, in spite of the fact I couldn't hurt anybody, let alone kill somebody. Totally avowed pacifist. But I went in and I was arm, an army officer just after my 19th birthday. And the one thing there was all control was taken away from your own life. You could be sent out to be shot and killed anywhere. Again, women don't experience that kind of thing. Little boys who were sent off to prep school at eight and have never left home before, torn away from their families, sent off to prep school. In, in the army, we, it was a very tough environment. And we just, many of us hadn't left home before, the 18-year-olds. The public school boys had, and they tended to fit in more readily. But it was really tough. You had no control over your own life. You had no control over life and death, even. You could be sent out to be shot. Three quarters of a million men, young men, were killed in the First World War. And twice that number were maimed and wounded and so on. If you look at who does the rough and the dirty jobs now, who gets down in the hole in the road? You know, it's men who are out on rainy building sites and die young because of their difficult life. Men on the whole have a six-year less life expectancy than women. And it's nearly all down to environmental factors. So, sorry. <laughs> there were the problems of childbirth as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know... They're, they're, yes, I understand. No, it's sides. nice to hear you say that. They're both well. sides. Yes, but absolutely. Being, being men has certain disadvantages. <laughs> sorry, Dave. <it's> your turn. <laughs> She's staggering there. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, Shami. Metrosexuality. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, could you start again? What, what do you think, because you're much closer to it than I am, do you think it is a, re a balancing, or is it... Sorry, it's just asked, do you think the uh, recent increase in what's called metrosexuality yeah. is re redressing the balance? Yes, what do you think? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I, I don't, obviously I'm far too old to know about... But <laughs> I, I've had that question raised before, was that a kind of... What, a more I feminine mean, expression in men, young, I, young I men, I think really, with I my peers in the kind of alternative set, ah, right. um, certain things are not uncommon uh, for what men to wear makeup, you know, eyeliner right. and mascara, and, or for men to wear long or far too short PVC skirts and that sort of thing. It's, it's not. And also for both men and women to have Mohicans and piercings, tattoos. Yes. It's very normal in the circles that we go in. I mean, my husband, yeah. he's incredibly masculine, but he's got long hair. He plucks his eyebrows and wears mascara. Uh, never, when we're out, does he ever get attacked for being gay? Right. Or, Nobody would ever consider my husband gay in any way, shape, or form. Right. Not even my partner, who's kind of of the school, even though he's got long hair and stuff, he kind of thinks any grooming beyond washing your face is, is kind of gay and not very masculine, but he doesn't even have that opinion of, of Nina's husband. It's, yeah, right. Do you think there's just much more but different we, we ways of being nowadays? But in, in, in our kind of culture, I suppose, we're freaks. Yeah, well, that's the other aspect, We're grebos, you know. Of that's course, guy, men wore makeup, and mods wore makeup in the 1960s, and uh, there's a David Bowie, of course. But, um, yes. So do you think things are changing then, yes, or...? Or are you just a kind of another...? Possibly. I think it's becoming like, more acceptable uh, for... Mm certainly on the kind of grooming side for men to... Yes. I, I, you know, I remember in the 90s there was this whole thing about the new man. Yes. And the idea of, of accepting, you know, being emotional and being sensitive. And I think that's kind of disappeared. It's not really yeah. mentioned anymore yeah. or discussed. Yeah, I mean, you're right, Shami. There was a very big thing, men's groups in the 1990s. According to some sociologists, we're going to rival the earlier generations of feminism, people like Robert Bly writing books like Iron John. And it does seem to have gone into a bit of a hush lately. I agree with you. Oh, it's coffee. Yes, it's coffee. Well, break, I isn't think it? we better call a halt yes. there, although okay, obviously okay. we could go on for the next hour very, very happily. Yes. We've got a little but, break now, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. But let us thank Malcolm again well, thank very, you. very sincerely for his wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation.